And if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Jude. Before we even start into this new study, I want to challenge you in one regard, and that is I don't have a single application question in my notes this morning. And as the majority of our small groups will be meeting tonight, and one of the key components to the discussion regarding to this morning's teaching will be application question, before we even start into this, this is your assignment this morning. Uh, Not to simply ask questions related to what has been taught, but I want you to be thinking, even as I'm teaching this morning, what are some appropriate application questions that I can share with our small group tonight that we can talk about? So you have been given the assignment to come up with application questions, questions of application, okay? You can ask questions of the test text as well, but these are questions of application. That's your assignment. So if you haven't already, open your books to the open your Bibles to the book of Jude. Easy enough to find. If you don't know where you're going, it's the second to the last book of your Bible. It's right before the book of Revelation. Um, and as we recognize, um, we look at this, it might not be super easy to find if you want to look at it in this regard. Because at least in the way that my pages of Scripture are laid out, it literally takes up one front and back piece of paper. Uh, it's a very short verse. It's just a, or it's just a single chapter with 25 verses. Uh, so it's a small portion of our Bibles, and yet it's the Word of God. We're going to look at it in regards to it that way. Uh, when I look at its size, at the scale, the scope of how large the book of Jude is, Um, It ties with the book of Philemon, 25 verses. It's only longer than two other books, 2nd and 3rd John. And though it was the last book admitted into the canon of Scripture, it stood the test of time. We're going to talk more about that in a minute, about it's just its validity and the fact that we need to know that this has been... um, authorized and approved by the apostles in the early church and how we know it belongs in the canon of scripture, we can confidently know that this is the very word of God. I've had more than one of you this week ask me the question, essentially, you ready? Why Jude? What are you thinking? Uh, The men are going to be working through tomorrow night in systematic theology on the clarity of scripture. One of you in particular was like, yeah, but is Jude clear? What in the world is going on in Jude? And part of what I want to talk to us about, even as we introduce this morning, is that as a pastor, as shepherd, teacher, it's my duty to feed you the whole counsel of God's Word. And too often, when we look at the pages of Scripture, when we we open our Bibles, we kind of clean up and spend our time in the Bibles the way a teenager cleans their bedroom. You know what I mean by that? When you walk into a teenager's bedroom who's been given the instruction to clean their room, there might not be anything left on the bed, maybe, if it's a good day. There might be a passageway that you can walk around the bed and get around in that room, but in the corners and against the wall, it's just loaded with stuff, right? Dirty clothes and some of you as parents are nodding your heads, and some of you as teenagers are looking at me like, shut up. (laughs) I can read nonverbal communication. Sometimes we study Scripture in a similar way. We look at, like, the main, the center, the, the things that are kind of the heartbeat, the things that are obvious, the things that are clear. We like to look at the Gospels and some clear portions from the Old Testament. Maybe we like to look to the Psalms and things like that. And it's not uncommon that books like Jude get relegated to those corners, and frankly, they just kind of never, in a positive way, get swept up, if we want to say it that way. In some of those conversations I had with some of you this week uh, regarding the question of why in the world the book of Jude, I asked, have you ever been taught? Have you ever been through a sermon series through through the book of Jude? And the ones that I asked universally said, yeah, no. No, I've never been taught through the book of Jude. So that tells me that we have a responsibility. We need to clean up that corner. We need to spend some time in there. But our objective is not simply to say, there, we've taught everything. This is not a checkbook teaching, if you know what I mean. We're not simply looking at this list of tasks and saying, okay, there, we got that done. You guys, 
as we often like to remind ourselves, this is the word of God. Uh, by the divine work of God, through the inspiration of Scripture, God has, by His will, by His purpose, made Himself known to us, given us His instruction in this particular teaching that we're looking at this morning in the book of Jude. And there are things here that we need to learn. There are things that we need to understand. And we can confidently walk away from a study like this saying, we have been taught, we have been exhorted, we have been trained up, through the word of God in the book of Jude. Now, the book of Jude is an interesting book. When we look at this book of Jude, we recognize that this short epistle cites lots and lots of Old Testament teaching. Uh, and it's, it's teaching a principle, which we'll get here to in a minute. It's teaching a primary principle, but it's doing it through the lens of Old Testament events, things that are happening throughout the Old Testament. By the way, those of you that have been here throughout Sunday school this last year and what's coming in this next quarter, think about the biblical theology that we've been working through together as a church. Jude is showing us through the lens of biblical theology that these events that have taken place in the Old Testament teach us something from a New Testament perspective. That's important for us to see. The book of Jude refers to and talks about the Exodus and God leading his people up out of Egypt and judgment that came in regards to that. He makes reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. He talks about Cain. He talks about Balaam. He talks about Korah. He talks about Enoch. He talks about Adam. Did I mention there's only 25 verses? Think about that. Jude mentions and interacts between, he, he talks and mentions about an interaction between the archangel Michael and the devil as they contended for the body of Moses that's frankly going to cause us to go, what in the world is going on here? And yet if it is not for this account in Jude, frankly, from the record of his, scripture, we would go, didn't know that happened. He's teaching us a greater principle in regards to that. We'll get to that in a few weeks. Even as this citation is important regarding Michael and the devil and the body of Moses, even as this is important as recorded in the pages of Scripture, it's given for a reason. It's not just obscurity. It's not just a matter of Jude saying, look at what I know. Jude has recorded this for a purpose. The other thing that's almost universally true is I've read lots and lots of commentaries in preparation for this study is that Jude contains one of the most beautiful benedictions, or some of us would identify it as a doxology in all of Scripture. The commentaries that give an overview and talk about the content and why Jude is here, they almost universally point to this benediction. This benediction in verses 24 and 25 is going to become very familiar with us, to us, excuse us, excuse me, having a hard time with those plural pronouns that we're using here this morning. But it's, <clears throat> as we recognize that, Frequently, when we study through a book of the Bible, we will look out and find a key passage from this text that we're going to recite or look to frequently throughout. It's my intention that at the conclusion of every one of our messages, as we conclude, we don't often close with a benediction. For the next six or eight weeks, we're closing with a benediction. Jude chapter 24 and verses 25 say this, Now... To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. The heartbeat of this letter is a warning regarding false teaching. This is the central message that we're going to see happening in the book of Jude. It, we can recognize that false, false teachers have now infiltrated the church. When we look at the whole teaching of the New Testament, we can see a repetition of this kind of a warning. We might say it starts with Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Jesus says, beware, and I'm pointing out, these are words from Christ himself. This is going to become significant as I point us back to Jude in a minute. Jesus says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. In a similar way, the apostle, I'm pointing this out in a very particular way, the apostle Paul gives the same kind of a warning in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 and 30. So Jesus gives this warning, 
The Apostle Paul gives this warning. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which God the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. These are words to the pastors, by the way. To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing, from, not sparing the flock. Verse 30, and from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Jesus gives this warning. The Apostle Paul gives this kind of a warning. And then we can turn to the book of 2 Peter. When we look to the book of 2 Peter, again, the Apostle Peter, Cephas, as we see in several other passages of Scripture, same person, he gives the same kind of warning. Jesus gives this warning. The Apostle Paul gives this kind of warning. Peter, the Apostle, gives this kind of a warning. And then just a, just a small caveat before we read this section from 2 Peter, most commentaries would agree that Jude and 2 Peter are companion books. They have matching messages that harmonize and match together. And, and though I clearly have not prepared my notes through this entire teaching of Jude, I believe we're probably going to spend a lot of time looking at 2 Peter as we're working through Jude in the coming weeks. So here Peter, the apostle, says this in 2 Peter chapter 2. But false, excuse me, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. By the way, note, all of these references we're reading, they're future tense. Just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in decisive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their, sensu their, their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words, their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. The Lord himself, the apostles, give these kinds of future tense warnings. What we're going to clearly see in the book of Jude is this. We're going to see this warning also come up in the book of Jude. But we're going to see something that changes in the tone and the way that this is addressed in the warnings that come from Jesus and the other apostles who we've cited here, their future tense. The tone is, they're coming. Be ready. Be on guard. The tone, the tense of Jude, you ready? They're here. They're in your midst. They're among you. It says this in verse 4 from Jude. For certain people, have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God, the grace of our God, into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. It's in verse 17 to 19 that we see the same kind of statement brought up, which, by the way, we might say that these are bookends to what is included between them, or the two slices of bread and the meat between them are all these Old Testament citations of these issues. And now we see a slice of bread in verse 4, and then we see the slice of bread in Jude verses 17 to 19. But you must remember, verse 17, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. What predictions? Fierce wolves are coming. When I depart, they're coming. That's what Jude's pointing to. He's pointing toward these warnings that we just read a minute ago from the Lord and from the apostles. The predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause division, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. What we recognize is that as he speaks of these things, he's saying, they're here. They told us they're coming. They've arrived. They're here. And then another interesting thing is as we look at this entire short letter, only 25 verses, there's very little doctrinal discussion. There is very little doctrinal teaching. 
When we look at some of the other epistles, when from Paul or from Peter or from John and some of these other writings, there's doctrinal content teaching and affirming this, the church in this doctrine, in these truths. This is the truth. Another way to say it is because on the foundation of this t- truth we're teaching you, you know how to stand against these false teachers. Because Jude is coming at this from the perspective that says, you have the doctrinal foundation, you need to know how to address and identify these false teachers. He has very little doctrinal content in his, in his message. In fact, the only doctrinal content that we can really recognize in regards to who Christ is and the doctrine that could be confronted is in verse 4. In verse 4, it talks about the fact that they per- pervert the grace of our Lord. We'll talk about this next week. They also take advantage of the work that Christ has done. That's really the only identification of the doctrinal heresy that's taking place at this time. Another way to say it is this. We just got done with the book of Galatians. In Galatians, we know that there's the specific doctrinal heresy of grace plus works that Paul's addressing, right? Very plainly. In other epistles, we might look to some false teaching, teaching like regarding Gnosticism or paganism and some of the other doctrinal things that these uh, individuals are addressing. Jude doesn't do this. He simply is taking the perspective that says, you have that knowledge, this is how you identify these people who have crept in among you and what you need to do about it. What we see in Jude is not a correction or identification of what these false teachers teach their false doctrine. Rather, it is an identification of their character, the false teacher's character, their moral standards, their perversions, and the ramification of their presence in the church and the certain judgment that will come upon them. Jude's going to help us develop a standard by which we, Bethany Baptist Church, need to evaluate, need to expose, and need to recognize when and if these individuals are in our midst. That, that how we need to respond to them. This is fun. Who is Jude? Who is this guy? Who is this dude named Jude? I'm sorry, I couldn't avoid it. <laughs> the name Jude is a Hebrew derivative from the name Judas. We know that name. You don't run across many children named Judas these days, do you? The most infamous Judas we know is the one of the 12 that betrayed our Savior Jesus Christ. We would look to this idea of Judas and we would look at a simple abbreviation much as we would see a lot of our English names and the names that we know today. We know Joseph's named Joe, right? We know James that go by Jim. We know Margaret's who go by Marge. We know Catherine's that go by Kate. In this day, if your name was Judas, there's a good chance your buddies called you Jude, right? I don't think the Beatles coined that. Jude is the derivative or the simple, the nickname of Judas. And if we examine Scripture in this light, we can see there is more than than just the Judas that betrayed our Lord, but there are multiple Judes or Judas that are mentioned throughout the New Testament. That causes us to do a little bit of an examination, which I'm going to streamline for us because I think actually verse 1 really points us in the direction of which Jude we're looking at here. The greatest clue given to who the author of this epistle is is found in verse 1. Jude 1, it says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Because this is cool. There's some neat stuff going on here. This Jude, Judas, is the brother of James, which causes us to ask the next question, even though it's pretty obvious for some of us, who is Jude, or excuse me, who is James? Who is this James that we're looking at? We know that after the resurrection, after the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, James became the lead elder or the lead pastor of the church of Jerusalem. We could really say that the church of Jerusalem was the flagship or kind of the lead church among the churches as the church of Jesus Christ was expanding throughout the known world at that time. This is where the church began. It was from the moment of Pentecost that everything and everyone went out from the church of Jerusalem. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We're not talking about as Roman Catholics would the church of Rome. That's not what I'm saying. But it all starts in Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem was significant. It was important. And as we recognize this, James, because he is identified historically and from some things we see in the New Testament, is really kind of the lead pastor, we might say, of the church of Jerusalem. He is significant in the early church as it's growing and expanding. Jude gives citation to this James. James is my brother. Uh, uh, I know James, that one who is the pastor, who leads, who people look to the church of Jerusalem, they see him as a significant individual. This is my brother. But frankly, we see more documentation in Scripture of James' work in ministry throughout the early church than we do the majority of the other apostles. Some people want to give the title of apostleship to James. He is not an apostle. He is not one of the twelve, thirteen as we want to look at with Paul. He is not one of them, but he bears an apostolic authority in so many ways because of the early foundation of the church. Jude points to him. And James is the author of his own epistle, the book of, any idea what book this is? James. Wow, that's crazy how that works. Which is written, think about this, to the Jewish Christians who were dispersed out from the church of Jerusalem as a result of persecution. This makes perfect sense. So what is he saying as a pastor, James, what is he saying as a pastor, one of the elders of the church of Jerusalem, as he's looking at his flock spreading out throughout the world as a result of persecution? Oh, I still have a pastoral duty to these people. I'm not going to write them an email. I'm not going to do some post, a short video on Instagram. I need to write them a letter which stands in the scriptures as the inspired word of God. James is also the one who presided over the council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. We spent time looking at that in Galatians, remember? He is the one who stood over this, and this was the question that needed to be resolved, the question of law and grace in regards to the Gentiles. How is this to be resolved? And according to Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, this is where it all comes full circle. Galatians 1.19 tells us this. Paul says, But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. If you weren't getting it already, did it just come into focus? This is significant. It's commonly held that James was the next oldest son of Mary uh, in the birth order after the next youngest after Jesus, conceived by Mary and Joseph. But the half-brother, not the full brother of Jesus, because Jesus wasn't conceived of Joseph. James was. Here's the cat falling out of the bag. And so was Jude. Crazy. It's profound when we think about the fact that this relationship, that Jude is in a sense kind of secondarily pointing toward, but he doesn't dare out of humility make that claim. What does it say in verse 1 again? Jude, a servant, not a half-brother, not the younger brother, not the one who grew up with our Lord. No, he says, I'm just a servant, just a servant of Jesus Christ. And if I'm going to claim anything, it's probably in regards to apostolic authority, Second tier through James and the brother of James. Jude is also the half-brother of Jesus. We don't know the birth order. Don't even know how many siblings or half-siblings Jesus had. But somewhere in that delineation of that birth order, Jude falls. See the next younger than James? Maybe. Are there three or four between them? Maybe. Don't know. But he's one of the younger brothers of James, who is also the half-brother of Jesus. Jesus' brothers thought he was crazy. Think about this, guys. They thought he had lost his mind. There's a family intervention, at least one of them and recorded in Scripture, where the brothers come alongside dealing with big brother who's out of his mind. Mark chapter 3 talks about this. We can say quite confidently James was present when this takes place. And when his family heard it, this, the ministry, the teaching, the things that Jesus was doing, they went out to seize him. For they, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And what's clearly shown here, and we see again through the whole teaching of the Gospels, Jesus' brothers, they didn't believe him. They grew up with him. 
They lived under the shadow of him, and there's so much that we could uh, extrapolate, but the scriptures don't tell us these things. But through their years of growing up under the shadow of Jesus, they were not believers. They didn't believe that he was the son of God. They didn't believe uh, that, that he was the one given as the savior of the world. They didn't believe these things. And Jude was the brother who did not believe Jesus was the son of God. It's in John chapter 7, verse 15, or excuse me, verse 5. It says this, for not even his brothers believed in him. It's a pretty all-inclusive statement. How many brothers there are? We don't know. But Jude's one of them. Jude doesn't believe. And the evidence indicates that these brothers did not believe until after the resurrection, at some point following the resurrection, maybe not even until after Pentecost. Just guessing. We don't know these. This is no authority in this statement. Maybe there are some of the 3,000 who were baptized on the day of Pentecost. Maybe. I don't know that. But it's sometime in this time frame that these brothers who rejected, who thought Jesus was crazy, who did not believe, they believed. Surely this is the Son of God, my big brother half-brother. It's in this context that, G that Jude does not count himself worthy of directly identi identifying himself as a brother of Jesus. And yet he calls upon the authority of his brother James, the pastor, the lead pastor, one of the main elders in Jerusalem, as he pens these words that bear the weight of the word of God. This is the word of God. I'm going to read this, and it's important. Though neither Jude nor James are apostles, they are both clearly in the inner circle of the apostles. They both write the word of God as endorsed by those with the authority of the apostles and their authorship is supported and endorsed by the early church as the very word of God. This is important. When we look at the canonization of Scripture, which simply talks about the authority, the standard, when we open the Word of God and we see the books which are comprised here in this Bible, how do we know these belong in the Word of God? The book of Jude was the last book to be admitted in that canonization. But the strong endorsement of the early church as they looked at the criteria to establish what belongs in the Word they said, it might be the last that we've come to, concluded on, Jude is the word of God. And so therefore, we're not going to relegate it to the corners, brothers and sisters here at Bethany. We're going to examine what God has to teach us from the word of God. It's important for us to know that. Jude says, I am the servant of Jesus Christ, or of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. And the salutation echoes with the voice of his own brother, James. What does James say in the introduction to his letter? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. doesn't say I'm a half-brother. I'm just a servant. And these are men who have called, could have called upon the credentials of growing up under the shadow of Jesus. They could have called on so many of those things, but they don't. We are simply slaves. We are simply servants of Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're going to switch gears partway through this introduction. We're going to look at the first three verses. We're going to particularly digest what has, what's taking place in these first three verses. And this is what we see. You ready? Turn your Bibles if you don't have it open. If you got lost in some of the latter chapters of Jude, just go to the first chapter of Jude. Okay. The first chapter of Jude, verses 1 to 3. This is what it says. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary, necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Those of you who are regulars, you know what I'm going to say. But say it with me. You ready? This is the word of God. Don't forget that. Here's your simple three-point outline. Number one, and it does follow with the verses, and we've already digested that first phrase out of verse one. We're just going to say verse one. To the called, beloved, and kept. Verse two. Mercy, peace, and love. 
Number three, found in verse three, contending for the faith. So this is what we're going to start to see as we work through this text. Number one, to the called, beloved, and kept. After Jude introduces himself, he addresses those who are recipients of this letter. And how does he describe them? To those who are called. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. I think it's important. I want to say it even before we go further. Not by Jesus Christ. For for Jesus Christ. When we see this opening statement, the expression called, uh, a similar word, though it's not the same word, or chosen, are two of the most common words used in the New Testament to describe those who belong to Jesus Christ. Following maybe second or right on par with them would be the word saints. Those are not words that we frequently use in the church today to describe one another. When we think about the church, we might think about Christians or different kinds of terms or synonymous terms that would talk about those who are saved, those who are born again, new creations in Christ. How often do we address one another as the called? Yet that's how Scripture describes us. These words all refer to those who are saved in Jesus Christ. If you are a new creation in Christ... If you are a child of God, remember Galatians talked about calling out to God the Father as Abba, right? If you are a child of God, if you have been saved, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in, I just said that wrong, salvation by, help me out. Come on, I gave it to you for for six months, say it with me. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You ready? If that's who you are in Christ... You might not like this word. It might bristle against teaching you've grown up with or been exposed to in the church. You can't fight with what Scripture says. You are the called. You might want to fillet that down and say, oh, that means something completely different. The called are those who are new creations in Christ. And this is the call of God unto lost sinners who were once dead in their sin, but by God's grace have been gloriously reconciled to God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. This is not of our own works. This is what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. This is incredible to think about. We were once alienated. We were once enemies of God, but we have been restored. I think Ephesians chapter 2 speaks so gloriously about this. You have to look at it. We'll frequently look at this passage as a church. It's good enough. Let's do it again. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, this is what it says. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. This is who we formerly were. This is who we were as enemies of God. We were not following after God. We were following after Satan himself. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, This doesn't sound like a servant of God. This sounds like someone who's the servant of their own flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and were and of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We were children of wrath. Because of our sin condition, because we were enemies of God, because we were in rebellion to God, we were by nature objects of God's horrible terrible, indescribable wrath. It's not a friend of God. We are objects of his wrath. Got preaching and I lost my my place. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Even as he has been raised, we have been raised with Christ, we would say. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that, so that, in the coming ages, he might show his immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You can accept this reality from the word or contend against it. That word contend is not by incident. You can contend against the truth of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. But the word of God clearly shows us this, you ready? Calling. To be called by his own sovereign choice, even before the world began. That's Ephesians 1. Again, I have to say this. You might hear these words and go, oh, I don't like the way that sounds. Where's he going with this? It doesn't matter where I'm going with this. This is what the Word of God says. In this reality of our salvation, we are, according to verse 1, Jude, beloved in God the Father. <clears throat> if you are in Christ, he has chosen you. He has called you. He has declared you to be his saints, not as a result of your good works. Praise God for that. Not as a result of your good deeds. Remember, you were an alien of God, a stranger, an enemy. You were an object of his wrath, not because of who your parents are. Not because of the home you grew up in. Not because of the country you grew up in. Not because of the church you grew up in. Not because of where you live. You are called not by your merit. Nothing about you deserves this. Your calling is by the very nature of God's love toward you. And you can't say that you deserve any of that. It's only because of God. It's only, only, only because of who God is. And there's something glorious that comes next in verse 1. Look down in verse 1. As a result of who God is and what he has done, you are kept. Do you see that? You are kept for Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to see this progress throughout this letter, but there are numerous times this theme, this idea of security, of being kept, of being held, to not be released, to not be let go, this is a common theme or idea throughout this short little 25-verse letter of Jude. When we are recognizing that as a church, there are people who are coming in, who are bringing false teaching, and the church is being called upon by Jude to contend against this, what is he continually reminding them of? But if you're in Christ, you're kept. If this is who you are, you're secure. Nobody, nothing, nothing can do anything to remove this. This is the doctrine of preservation. This is the doctrine of the preservation of the saints, the security of the believer. Coin it however you want, the once saved, always saved teaching of Scripture, which, by the way, is grossly misused by the church. Frequently misused that if you walked down front and did an altar call, if you prayed a prayer after Sunday school teacher, if you asked Jesus into your heart, then you're saved and nobody can take that from you. Let me just add to that, if it was real. Remember, salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, not a work of our own doing. If your faith and your dependence is on a prayer, some kind of action that you took, a baptism or a Lord's table or something like that, that's not what this preservation doctrine is about. But hear this out, guys. If you're getting hung up on the teaching of the called, in my opinion, the single greatest argument for the security of the believer, <laughs> the doctrine of election. If you are called by him, if you are chosen by God, if God, by his sovereign will and choice, gave his own son to be the propitiation for your sin, let me ask this in a question. Is there anything you can do to undo that? Think about it. Is there anything that the powers of this world can do to undo what God has completed according to his infinite plan before the foundations of this world? Is there anything that Satan can do in regards to this that can remove the greatness of what God has accomplished in your salvation? Romans chapter 8 speaks of this. 
Paul sounds pretty confident. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this salvation and this power, it's not about you. Remember what I pointed out to us as we read that second part of verse 1? We are called... We're saved, we are the beloved, and we are kept for Christ. We are preserved for Christ. This is why Jude says he is a servant of Jesus Christ. He is a slave of Jesus Christ. You ready? What does it mean to be a slave? You are a possession. You are owned by him. You have been redeemed. You have been purchased by Jesus Christ himself. For what purpose? Well, we could take this, and rightly so, from verse 1. We could say it's because he loved us, which is true. For God so loved the world, which is true. But ultimately, what this text is showing us is we are preserved, we are kept for Christ. Why? Unto his glory. To glorify Him, which takes us back to Ephesians 2 again. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it tells us this. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which He loved us, all true, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ. This is our position in Christ. Why are we kept? Verse 7. So that in the coming ages, this is future tense, this is still to come, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why are we kept? Because there's going to be a day that you will be put on display to the glory of Jesus Christ. This is what's being spoken of in Jude chapter 1, verse 1. You are called, you are beloved by the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 7, why? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his kindness, of riches, <laughs> immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. Wow. Second point, mercy, peace, and love. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. As a a result of the reality of God's work to save us, we have received mercy. We have not not received what we deserve. We have not received it. What do we deserve? Wrath judgment, death. But by God's mercy, we have not received what we deserve. The other side of mercy is grace, receiving what we do not deserve, an unmerited favor. And as a result of God's mercy, we are, again, verse 2, at peace. Shalom. We are no longer alienated. We are no longer estranged, no longer enemies of God. Remember Ephesians chapter 2? That's who we used to be. But we have now been brought into peace because of the work of Christ. As a result of his mercy, we now have peace. And what does it say? And we are loved by him. That's an incredible thing to think about. If you have been sinned against, If you have been trespassed against, if you have been hurt and violated in the deepest, harshest ways, in our flesh, it is difficult for us to comprehend what it really means to love the one who has hurt you. This is so much more exponentially greater than anything we can comprehend in our flesh. The ways that we have trespassed and violated God's holy standard. I have not just sinned against you. I have not just simply sinned on this horizontal plane. I have sinned against you and you alone, O God. And yet by his work, 
by his merit, by the completeness of what he has done, we are now loved by God. You guys, this is a reality. This is not obscurity. This is an irrevocable truth. If you are called, you are loved and kept. You are held. You have received mercy. You are no longer an alien of God. You are at peace with God. And yet Jude petitions for more of all of this for us. Look what he says in verse 2. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. I remember as a little kid getting the distinction between addition and multiplication. You know what I'm talking about? He's not simply saying, I hope you get a little bit more. He's saying, this mercy, this peace, and this love, may it be multiplied to you. He's not saying more salvation, but God's mercy, God's peace, God's love. He says, we just want more and more of this, which takes us back to Ephesians 1. Hear this, guys. In Ephesians 1, verses 6 to 8, this is what it says. To the praise of his glorious grace in which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now think about multiplication in regards to what it says here in verse 8. Which he lavished on, upon us in all wisdom and insight. Now, what Ephesians chapter 1 starts to talk about is the greatness of God's riches, the, the multitude, the capacity in which God is capable of blessing us in regards to these things. He's talking about mercy. He's talking about peace. He's talking about love. And this multiplication of mercy, peace, and love is on the basis of God's power, his supreme power, which is unlimited, without end. There is no end to the level of his love. There is no, le- no end to the level of his mercy or his peace toward us. There is no location that cannot be met. Listen to this as he continues to say this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. What's he saying there? I want you to see this. I want you to see how great this is. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Oh, there it is again. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. According to the working of his great might. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. He is the authority over all things is what he's saying there. And gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Now take that quotient, take that caliber, take that concept, and bring that back to Jude 1, verse 2. Mercy, peace, and love, according to who God is, may it be multiplied to you. That's a lot, guys. That's a lot, a lot. And Jude contends for that. Last point, verse 3. Beloved, though I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In verse 2, remember, we revert back and he says, the beloved. He tells them his personal intent was to write them regarding our common salvation. Jude had personal designs to address other things. He says, my design was to write. I I intended to sit down with pen and ink, we might say, and I was going to write you a letter about our common salvation. What's he saying here? But God the Holy Spirit, as he breathes forth the word of God, he had a different intent. God desired for me to write to you about something different. And what does he say here? I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. I wanted to write to you about our common faith and salvation, but now I'm writing to you in the fact that you have to contend. You have to fight for this faith. 
You have to fight for this. And in this segue is the heart of this letter. It's to contend. It's to fight, to grapple, to box. I don't know if this is MMA, but you can call it that if you want. That's the idea. Compete toward this. To contend against false teaching. To contend for the gospel of Jesus Christ. To contend for the faith. Why? Verse 4. Next week, because certain people have crept in. They're here, is what Jude is saying. Therefore, they're to contend for the faith, for all the saints through all the generations. You hear the eternal component to this? The faith that was once for all delivered to all the saints. You guys, I don't want to take out God's sovereign plan and his preservation over the reality of the doctrine of salvation. God's done that. But we also can point to this, that there have been generations of the church that have preceded us that have contended for the faith of Jesus Christ. If we want to look at it through that focal point, we are recipients of God's sovereign hand working through the church that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been contended for, that we have it some 2,000 years later. Because that's a miracle. And these are our brothers and sisters in Christ who Jude writes to a couple thousand years ago who we contend with for the same faith. We stand side by side with our brothers and sisters, called by God to the same faith we walk in today. And this is the same faith we are called to contend for in Dollar Bay, Michigan, at Bethany Baptist Church in the year 2024. Kept. For this purpose. Would you please stand? And we may stumble a little bit as we become familiar with the rhythm of how we're going to read this together. But read this benediction with me together. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.